Hello and welcome to News Click. President Obama's recent visit to India has of course received a lot of press attention with some terming it a game changer in Indo-US relations. While a large part of the focus was of course on the nuclear liability deal, the two countries have also signed a number of agreements relating to cooperation in areas such as defense, the economy and development in clean energy. Of particular interest are the joint strategic vision announced for the Asia Pacific and Indian Ocean regions and the renewal of the 10-year defense strategic framework first signed between the two countries in 2005. To discuss the key takeaways from Obama's visit to India, we're joined by Prabir Purkaista from the Delhi Science Forum and a member of the All India People Science Network. Hi Prabir. Now, how does the joint strategic vision actually help India? India and the US, of course, have some uh, shared interest in the Afghanistan-Pakistan region, as well as when it comes to China. But is it actually in India's best interest to be seen to be so close to the US? You know, there has been an argument that US wants to pivot east, pivot to Asia. This is something they have been talking about for the last two years. Not very successfully because of what's happened in Iraq and various other places. They have not been able to disengage also from Afghanistan, even today. But nevertheless, the long-term vision of the United States is clearly a pivot to Asia and leave out Europe to its, you know, to its allies. That's the basic framework that it sees itself operating in. India has articulated a policy of look east. Mm -hmm. So that's the other part of uh, uh, the framework. When you put two together, then they come together to say we are going to have some joint vision regarding uh, South China Sea, mm -hmm. the Indian Ocean and so on. Now the South China Sea is of course an area where India may claim some interest because it has some relations with Vietnam on oil exploration etc. But legitimately it is not a sphere of India or America's a strategic interest. Mm -hmm. It is really not a part of that. So when we talk about India and America talking about the South China Sea, it is seen to be somebody from outside talking about an area which is much closer to China. It really concerns China's neighbors, including Japan. So this is would be seen as something which is extraneous to the strategic goals of the region. So I think India signing an agreement, talking about a joint vision and looking at the South China Sea making certain statements, not that the statements themselves have anything significant in them, really talk about the law of seas should be followed and so on. But the fact that issue making a joint statement with US talking about a, you know, containment of China really, the pivot to Asia is really containment of China. So it becomes now Japan, United States and India, this trinity as it were, coming together on the issue of containment of China. That's the way it will be read, unfortunately. So I think this joint vision statement, considering that it really has nothing significant to say in it, is something which helps America to get India as a kind of ally in this region, but really does not serve any of India's interests that I can see. What about, uh, many people have spoken about the fact that China has uh, increased investments in countries around India. So doesn't this show the beginning of, of, of a counterweight to China's attempts to progress in the Indian Ocean region possibly? See, the question again is India can have any number of agreements with any number of countries. So can China. That's really a part of what would be called normal statecraft of countries mm -hmm. in which economics is a part of that. There is really nothing which is different from which any country would do, which is large enough to play a certain role in international politics. So when you talk of a joint vision, then you are supposedly saying something more. The joint vision is not about India, it's not about the United States, it's really something which is the South China Sea. That's really what is mentioned explicitly. So you are talking about the existing tensions that China has with Japan, it has with Philippines, it has with Vietnam. So you are really talking about an area which is of strategic concern of these countries and from outside the United States and India are saying we are going to do certain things over there. So it does not give a very good, uh, shall I say, atmospherics if you are looking at it from the point of view of China because then it will be seen explicitly as an anti-China alliance rather than a pro something else. So that's my problem with this, this formulation of a joint strategic vision, which explicitly talks about South China Sea. So what does the Indo-US defense strategic framework specifically talk about and why has this been renewed? I mean, it, it was expiring in 2015. 
Now, do you also believe that increased defense cooperation with the US and its allies, I mean, we've been buying a lot of equipment now from Israel, is this problematic and why? We leave the Israel out for the time being. Let's look at the direct US relationship. Mm -hmm. We are buying a lot of defense equipment from them. But the defense strategic agreement that it has also means interoperability. Mm -hmm. That means the US and India must be able to operate together. That's one part of a defense strategic framework agreement. And if they operate together, they must have common equipment, which both sides can use. So in effect, it means buying American equipment. That's really what it means. And this has been an underlying theme of any of these defense strategic agreements that U.S. has signed. So if defense strategic agreement does not have interoperability, this issue would not arise. So essentially, it's a means to market American equipment for Indian uh, defense services. U.S. has been trying, after it reached an agreement with India, stopped the earlier uh, regime in which they could not sell arms to India directly because that followed from the NPT issues that the U.S. had earlier with India. I think that India is now seen to be a major arms buyer mm -hmm. internationally. So earlier, the Indian, India was buying arms from the United States largely through Israel as a conduit. Now it's going to buy directly and it is buying equipment directly. Now, as you've just pointed out, of course, uh, India has given large concessions to the U.S. in terms of opening up its markets for U.S. companies. I mean, India is committed to buying uh, U.S. products in the nuclear in, from the nuclear industry, military equipment, and of course, green technologies. Uh, we've already seen FDI limits also being increased uh, in, in areas like defense, which were considered sensitive sectors. Um, you also look at the $4 billion pledge that Obama has made to India, a large part of it India has to spend in the U.S., essentially, on U.S. companies. So what does India get out of all of this? You know, it's interesting. First, $4 billion is a small amount of money. Yeah. It's really not a large amount of money. A large part of it is supposedly for the Green Renewable Fund. Now, if you go back a little in history, you will realize that actually the United States was complaining that India was buying or protecting its internal market by giving incentives <coughs> to Indian equipment manufacturers of renewable energy. Mm -hmm. So if it was saying that you should buy from U.S. or you should allow U.S. to compete with Indian manufacturers for programs which are entirely domestic, which were really meant to support India's green energy programs. So now that seems to be, okay, we will subsidize your investments, so you also buy from the U.S. So it's essentially the indigenization policies in green energy, we seem now to be giving up for the sake of this so-called $2 billion or $1 billion of renewable funds. And let's face it, this is a very small amount. If you were 20,000 megawatts of green energy as the government wants to by 2020, it will need a magnitude of order of magnitude higher investments. As I said, the $4 billion is a small amount of money. It's not much of money. What India gets out of it, I really don't see. Because essentially, apart from the nuclear air sector, where they had committed technology, mm -hmm. these are all peanuts that we, we are talking about. Mm -hmm. And nuclear area, the technology that we are talking about, is not at the moment forthcoming. Westinghouse has already said that even if these agreements are taken on account, we still have to negotiate the question of price. Mm -hmm. And the minute you come to a nuclear power plant, and the costs are going to be so high, that it's going to be very difficult for government of India to really accept those nuclear plants at those costs. Now, uh, our, our Prime Minister has promised uh, that foreign companies' uh, intellectual property will be protected if they come into India and manufacture in India. Does this worry you given the history that India and the US have had regarding India's patenting regime? And do you think India should have taken this opportunity to push for acceptance of its TRIPS compliant patent regime? You know, it's an interesting issue that the intellectual property rights regime we are talking about, it is entirely TRIPS compliant. Mm -hmm. So any complaint against this, if the United States has, they can take us to the dispute uh, tribunal yeah. which is there in WTO. The fact they haven't done so while complaining about it, it seems to indicate they also accept it's TRIPS compliant. So what they're talking about is, why does India not have US patent laws? Now that I think is a completely bogus argument. Each country has a patent laws it has. Mm -hmm. And why does America not have Indian patent laws? It's a very good question to ask, considering that the cost of medicines 
are about 10 times the cost of medicines in India for even those drugs which are off patent. Mm -hmm. So this whole argument about that we must protect, give it American protection is a completely bogus argument. So yes, you are right. I think India had an opportunity to at least officially recognize it through this uh, discussions that India's patent regime, India's intellectual property right regime is TRIPS compliant and there is no further discussions to be had on that. That is something we have not been able to get. What we have got is really something which is relatively anodyne. Um, there is talk that India wants to and that President Obama will shortly seek uh, trade promotion authorities uh, uh, permission for India's participation in the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Group as well as in the Trans-Pacific Trade Negotiations. Uh, is this, do you believe, in India's interest, particularly given the you know tremendously restrictive provisions contained in many of these trade uh, agreements, for instance, in the TPP? TPP is an extremely dangerous agreement, as you know, mm -hmm. because it means giving trips plus protection mm -hmm. to intellectual property, what yeah. we're just discussing. It means overturning our patent regime and changing our laws. So that TPP is a, is a very dangerous one. Second about on T, TPP is also that it gives away jurisdiction, sovereign jurisdiction to essentially bodies which are completely outside law. Mm -hmm. So these are tribunals which are set up, they have authorities and we give away essentially our sovereign jurisdiction over national economic space by virtue of the TPP and similar agreements. APEC of course is an issue. If we get into APEC, then we also have to modify a lot of our uh, existing practices. But more than that, there is also the talk about a bilateral investment treaty, mm -hmm. which was into deep, which was in cold storage till now. It seems to have come out of the cold storage. We are talking about bilateral treaties again, at a time when bilateral treaties have been recognized to be something which are very dangerous. We have already been taken to on, on this issue by coal companies. Uh, are basically what we said, the fuel policy in the country for coal-fired plants. We have been taken in Australia to a dispute settlement tribunal and uh, there have been verdicts against us. Mm -hmm. So what it bilateral treaty, particularly those provisions which protect investments from outside against what are called national uh, appropriation and they could be simple things like regulating them. Mm -hmm. They could be simple things like you have to do X, Y or Z because that's what all domestic com companies have to do. They can be all considered as appropriation by the, say, the government or by the judiciary. So all this put together, bilateral treaties, investment treaties are extremely dangerous. That's all the time we have today. Thank you Prabir for joining us and do watch us again on News Clip.